Good morning and welcome to this, the eighth meeting of the College of Psychiatrists of Ireland Evolution and Psychiatry Special Interest Group. Our previous meetings are available on the YouTube channel of the college under our own playlist. As always, I would like to thank um, the college and Helen Murray in particular uh, for your support in uh, organising these meetings. For today's meeting, we will feature the joint winners of our inaugural essay prize, Dr. Silva Vartikaptani and Dr. Gurjat Brar. Silva and Gurjat will present summaries of their winning entries. So just to introduce Silva, Dr. Silva Vartikaptani is a registrar in psychiatry who studied medicine in Latvia and since 2015 has worked in Mayo, Dublin, Kildare and Leash. She is currently on a gap year, but she is still very busy uh, working um, from, um, from her basic specialist training, and she works part-time in Lee Shoffley, providing post-call cover for NCHDs, but she is also, of course, tutor for medical students from UCD. So, Silva, congratulations on your essay, and we look forward to hearing your summary now. Thank you, Professor Connell. I'll just try to share my screen now. Hopefully it will work out. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be invited to speak to you all about my essay on evolution and psychiatry. Um, I have to confess that I'm a beginner at exploring the ideas of evolutionary psychiatry and that uh, that is the viewpoint from which I wrote my essay. So I'm a little bit nervous to be talking to you all uh, who are experts on the subject. However, I still hope that you will find this presentation interesting and that it will give you some food for thought. So... So first I wanted to explain why I chose to write this essay. So when I saw the announcement of the essay title, it sparked my interest because I realized that it will allow me to combine my passion for children's well-being. Um, I strongly believe children are our future. They literally will run the world when we are old and investing in their well-being should be everyone's business. Uh, so to combine this with my chosen field of psychiatry and to look at it uh, in an evolutionary context, which I believe adds an important dimension to this conversation, as I will attempt to demonstrate um, in this uh, presentation. So um, I've structured this presentation in four main parts, which corresponds to the paragraphs of my essay. So in, in the first part, I talk about uh, my personal experience um, of how I um, was introduced to the, to the idea that evolutionary principles are very relevant to our current life. Next, uh, I will talk more in depth about two specific diagnostic categories. One of them is anxiety disorders, which I chose as an example of how evolutionary viewpoint is already being used to some extent in the understanding and treatment of the condition. And the second will be ADHD as an example of a future opportunity where I can see a potentially huge benefit for patients if we could uh, view this condition from an evolutionary perspective. And lastly, in conclusion, I'll give my answers to the question um, asked in the title of the essay. Um, in this presentation, I'll also mention a few additional points which I weren't able to touch upon in the essay due to the word count limit, um, but which will help further support some of the points I'll be making. So, and again, I want to re-emphasize that I'm not an expert in evolutionary psychiatry. I'm simply expressing my reflections on this topic. And as you will see, some of these views may be considered unconventional. However, my aim is not to convince you to agree with me, but simply to open up an honest conversation, discussion about this uh, important topic. So before uh, jumping into discussing the essay, I first wanted to set the scene by briefly taking a step back into a history of human evolution. I think it might be helpful in case there are people here who have uh, only joined recently uh, the special interest group and are still trying to figure out what's this all about. So as you can see in this scheme, uh, the human lineage split from uh, chimpanzee lineage around 7 million years ago. And the oldest known um, fossil attributed to the human genus, Homo, uh, dates to about 7 point, uh, sorry, dates to about 2.8 million years ago. And Homo sapiens, uh, which is currently uh, the only species of human on Earth, um, likely first evolved in Africa about 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. And only, 
only around 12,000 years ago, with development of agriculture, humans switched from nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle to permanent settlements and farming. So what does this mean? It means that for the most part of our existence, human lifestyle looked like this. Then relatively recently, it changed to this and only very, very recently to this. So our current modern world, which is all we know and which uh, we see as the norm actually has existed only for a tiny moment if we consider the context of the million years of human evolution. So it makes me wonder, since our bodies and brains have evolved in completely different contexts, what does it mean for us humans who are living now? How does it affect us? So my essay will try to explore this uh, question in more details and specifically in relation to mental illness. But first, um, so let's move uh, to the essay. And uh, first, I'll talk about how I realized the importance of this topic in my life. So I was the first time mother. Um, this was what I had expected, but this was the reality I was dealing with. My baby was waking up at night frequently and wanted to be held almost constantly. And I was overwhelmed, sleep deprived and confused because there was an enormous amount of conflicting information about childcare and infant sleep. And some of the information sources warned that th these baby behaviors are unhealthy habit that has to be fixed. While looking for answers, I luckily happened to find a book uh, by an experienced midwife, Rachel Fitzdesorger from Australia, who wrote, to me, it has always seemed so obvious that if a certain baby behavior is universal, there must be a good protective evolutionary reason for its existence. Our 21st century baby has exactly the same instinctive evolutionary drives to survive and takes no account of the modern noisy world he has entered. And this really made sense to me and made me realize that our current societal expectations that our young children should happily self-soothe and enjoy an uninterrupted sleep in their own separate rooms have not always been the norm and actually are in conflict with the evolutionary survival strategies. Imagine baby being left alone overnight in the hunter-gatherer society. It would likely have been a that sentence either due to hypothermia or attack by a predatory animal. So probably those babies who protested and cried the loudest when they were put down or left alone were the ones who survived and passed on their genes. So this newfound understanding um, and shifted my thinking um, did not miraculously stop my baby from waking up every two hours um, at night or wanting to be held constantly. But what it did was much more than that. I could finally stop worrying that something may be wrong with my baby or my parenting approach. And I could allow myself to relax and accept that this is uh, this is a normal behavior, although difficult, but normal behavior in this developmental stage. And this serves uh, as a testimony on how a simple awareness of the evolutionary principles can shift uh, the way a person feels and functions and help tolerate difficult situations for which maybe a quick solution is unrealistic. And I further explore how this principle apply to psychiatry. So in the second part of my essay, I talk about anxiety disorders um, as an example where some I feel some elements of evolutionary perspective are already being acknowledged, although maybe they're not specifically named as such. So we've all heard uh, about uh, cognitive distortions or cognitive biases, uh, which are common treatment targets in cognitive behavioral therapy. One of them is known as a negativity bias, uh, meaning that negative stimuli, which can be represented as sticks, um, are more readily noticed and have a greater impact than positive ones represented by carrots. So I, I bet you, you've all been in situation, um, or most of you, um, when your day is kind of going quite well, but then one difficult interaction with patient or colleague kind of sticks in your mind and it sets the tone for the rest of your day. You keep stewing over it, uh, no matter how many positive or neutral events happen afterwards. It can be hard to shake these negative experiences off. There's even saying uh, that uh, the brain is like a Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. And there is an evolutionary explanation to why we are prone to such thinking bias. It is because it had a protective purpose. Earlier in human history, those who were more attuned to danger and who paid more attention to the bad things around them were more likely to survive. This meant they were uh, also more likely to hand over uh, their hand down their genes that made them more attentive to danger. 
so as eloquently, eloquently articulated by a psychologist, Rick Hansen, in the tough environments in which our ancestors lived, if they missed out on a carrot, they usually had a shot at another one later on. But if they failed to avoid a stick, a predator, a natural hazard, or aggression from others of their species, one, no more chances to pass on their genes. In evolution, Mother Nature only cares about passing on genes by any means necessary. She doesn't care if we happen to suffer along the way. So, so we are motivated by both dodging sticks uh, and chasing carrots, but from an evolutionary perspective, it was a lot more important to notice, react to, and remember sticks uh, rather than the carrots. And besides, at its core, fear and anxiety are completely normal and protective reactions to a perceived threat. So our sympathetic nervous system becomes activated, releasing adrenaline in our bloodstream and preparing us to deal with the hazard, either by escaping, fighting or freezing, which is an ancient and nearly universal response in the animal kingdom. However, the type of the threats that we typically encounter nowadays are significantly different from those in the past. So instead of trying to survive in a, um, in a harsh surroundings, in the modern world, we are more likely to have to deal with situations such as presenting in front of others, work-related stress, relationship and financial stress, exams, traffic jams, cyberbullying, etc. Although our bodies still react in the same way to these modern stressors as if they were potential life or death situations by preparing us to fight or fl flight. However, escaping or attacking in these situations typically are not useful or helpful. So we're kind of stuck. Um, uh, there is no opportunity to implement these uh, strategies uh, or to discharge this built up tension and we can end up getting stuck in a chronically elevated state of stress. As, uh, as a solution to this problem, Several ways have been suggested that can help us return our bodies back to a parasympathetic state uh, of rest and relaxation. Uh, either it's uh, physical activity, breathing, relaxation techniques, social sports. Uh, these approaches have been widely acknowledged and endorsed as a part of treatment for uh, plan for anxiety disorders. So overall, when dealing with anxiety disorder, it is helpful to be aware of and accept that our brains have evolved under much different circumstances, with main priority being survival and reproduction. This allows us to normalize the cognitive biases and the automatic physiological re reactions in our bodies and helps us then creatively problem solve how we can better manage these reactions in the current context. And then uh, the second uh, psychiatric diagnosis I want to explore is ADHD. Uh, because in my opinion, evolutionary perspective in regards to this condition could be pivotal, but is currently not widely acknowledged in the mainstream psychiatric setting. As you know, ADHD is a common, a common uh, neurodevelopmental disorder affecting around, uh, depending on the source, but around 7.2% percent of people in the world, which makes it approximately one in 14, which is a lot. And it has been increasingly more diagnosed over the recent decades. Uh, so what you can see on the screen are the data from uh, Center of Disease Control in USA, but similar trends have been observed in other countries too, for which there are multiple proposed explanations like changes in diagnostic uh, criteria, changes in methodology of the studies, and changes in clinical practice. But I will try to explore this trend uh, of increasing diagnosis from a different perspective. As we all know, ADHD is, a commonly is commonly diagnosed during childhood, and although receiving diagnosis can be very valuable, as it gives access to highly effective treatment options, at the same time there is a risk of a possible negative long-term effects on children's sense of identity, self-esteem, and their hopes and beliefs about their future opportunities. As written by Dr. Sana Axen, who is a clinical psychologist uh, working in NHS, Suggesting we have a broken brain for life increases stigma and disempowerment. And children whose sense of self and identity is only developing could be especially susceptible to this. It can be demoralizing to believe that there is something wrong with you, that you're not normal. But again, if we look, if, if we actually look at uh, the society's expectation of what is normal and dissect how that has uh, these expectations have changed over time, it may offer us a different perspective on the problem. So 
we can easily imagine how the ADHD traits, you can see them here, uh, the main ones, um, how these traits um, would have been highly valuable in an ancient environment. For example, hyperactivity presenting as tirelessness and high need for movement would have had plenty of opportunity for utilization as the hunter gatherer lifestyle was constantly on the go with significant physical elements to many of their daily tasks. Secondly, inattention and distractibility, uh, meaning that person has a tendency for attention to easily shift towards things happening in the periphery, like the noises or movements, and they struggle to keep the focus on a single main task uh, and cannot easily sort of drown out competing stimuli. So this could have been protective while hunting. Uh, avoid uh, allowing uh, hunters to rapidly scan their surroundings uh, to avoid being unexpectedly attacked. For example, in this picture, um, the men are focused on hunting the deer, but if they hear some noise coming from behind this rock, um, but they ignore this noise and keep sort of just focusing only on chasing the deer, there's a risk that they will be eaten by another predatory animal who may be hiding behind the rock. So you can see the potential sort of benefit of this uh, trait. And the impulsivity uh, likely supported hunters' response readiness and ability to change their strategy quickly, which might have been, again, beneficial in their harsh ancestral in environments. So, for example, if you suddenly notice something that looks like a lion in distance and your first impulse is to, is to escape, it probably wouldn't be uh, very helpful or safe to say to yourself, wait a minute, I don't want to be acting too rushed. Let me just consider all the pros and cons of each action before I make the decision on what to do. But nowadays, when our environment looks completely different, these same traits that were previously highly valuable um, and adaptive, they can become disadvantage and are considered maladaptive. So this is called mismatch, mismatch theory. So basically, the same traits are adaptive in certain situations and environments and are not uh, adaptive or maladaptive in other environments. Um, I think that one of the biggest area of this mismatch is the educational setting, uh, making it increasingly difficult for people with ADHD traits to succeed. And I wonder if this could be one of the reasons why ADHD diagnosis has been raising. So according to the research by Dr. Peter Gray, who is an evolutionary psychologist, in relation to the biological history of our species, schools are very recent institutions. Needless to say that there were no schools, classrooms, and examinations in the hunter-gatherer societies. Children simply learned what they needed to know to become effective adults through their own play and exploration. With the rise of agriculture and later of industry, children became forced laborers and play and exploration were suppressed. And what we currently recognize as conventional schooling gradually evolved in the 19th and 20th century. So it's only around 200 years old. Uh, however, even in the recent decades, the school systems have continued to change considerably. So um, as uh, Peter Gray has, uh, has said, the length of the school year has increased. It now averages five weeks longer than in the 1950s. The number of years of required attendance has increased. The amount of homework has increased immensely, especially in elementary schools. Recesses have been reduced. Fun activities such as art and music have regularly been dropped from curricula in favor of more time for worksheets and test preparation. And ever greater pressure has been placed on children to score high on standardized tests. So if we carefully consider the above information, we will realize that what we know uh, now as normal actually isn't natural from an evolutionary perspective. The modern environment and requirements are unprecedented and vastly different to what human brains and bodies uh, have adapted to, had adapted to. So schools can be very challenging, even for typically developing child. But if you add an ADHD brain uh, to the mix, no wonder these children are struggling in current educational system. And um, I would actually argue that the mismatch between the ADHD traits and the environment is becoming less prominent in the work setting as opposed to the educational setting. 
Uh, the work scene has been rapidly changing too. So jobs have appeared only recently, which were not even possible in the past, such as social media, media influencers. There's an abundance of freely available information on internet, which people can use to self-educate and build their skills. Therefore, formal education uh, is not the only way anymore, especially in some areas. Um, and many companies are also much more flexible regarding time management and remote working options. Uh, there is an emphasis on team work where people's differing strengths and approaches are actually appreciated. And I think that uh, with a further development of artificial intelligence, the uh, sort of repetitive jobs will become automated and employers will in be increasingly looking for people who are good leaders, team workers, who are assertive, creative and original thinkers, who are good at problem solving, are intrinsically motivated, self-directed, and have expertise in certain area. And I think that um, if we look at, at people who have ADHD from strength-based approach, many of them actually have these qualities. For example, they often perform well under pressure and they have ability, uh, many of them have ability to hyper-focus on things that they enjoy. Uh, whereas if we look at what kind of characteristics are typically valued and taught in conventional schooling, such as obedience, mechanically remembering information and facts, only having one correct solution or answer to the problem, um, kids are typically being motivated by achieving high grades on tests and strive to be successful at every subject. So to me, this raises a question, is this really the best way and most efficient way to get to this? Well, I would be interested in your thoughts on this. And finally, this is my last slide. So what can we do about it? So I'm not suggesting that we should discard our current evidence-based interventions for ADHD. They have their place and they have helped many, but if we could simply broaden our understanding of ADHD to include an evolutionary explanation, um, if we could see the ADHD traits as adaptive in certain contexts and environments and a liability in other, uh, some other contexts, rather than just a simply sort of overarching deficit, I think it would do two things. It would help normalize and validate some of our common human experiences and reduce the stigma associated with this diagnosis. And secondly, it would potentially open up new opportunities for interventions and supports by also addressing the environmental and societal factors, rather than seeing a person's mental health struggles solely as their uh, individual failure. So I may be too optimistic or naive, but I believe that we humans are more than capable of inventing creative strategies on how to tweak our current educational work systems in order to offer more individualized approach for the benefit of many. Just look uh, at the inventions humans have already come up with. So overall, um, from my personal and professional experience, I conclude that uh, evolutionary psychiatry is a positive development, uh, which hopefully one day will be integrated in the mainstream psychiatric practice. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Silva. That was really superb. And uh, I really enjoyed that. And you certainly came across to me as being an expert. Uh, sounds like you've completely immersed yourself in the area. And I really like the way you've integrated your own personal experiences as a, a new mom and as a clinician and as an intellectually curious scientist and, you know, brought all these things together. Um, so, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate your feedback. Thanks. And um, I just put it out to the, the floor then, if we maybe have time just for maybe one or two questions, if anyone would like to ask Silva a question. Yes, Ralph. I, I thanks, Silver. I really enjoyed that, particularly the bit about not worrying so much about babies who, who don't want to be part of from you. I, I, I was thinking um, we see uh, anxiety disorders as more common in women and ADHD being more common in men. I mean, does evolutionary theory give us some answers to that or some speculation? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think the part about ADHD and men, I can see that being sort of coming together in a sense that uh, men were the, the, typically the ones who went hunting 
uh, so sort of that those traits, as as I already uh, discussed in the slides, were sounds like particularly useful in the, in those contexts. About women and anxiety, I would actually love to hear. I would love to hear maybe your uh, some experts in this uh, in this uh, area to maybe step in and answer that if if anybody have an ideas because honestly, I don't know. I, I, I'm I bet not an, there is some something yeah. hiding there, but yeah. I'm not an expert, but assuming that gender roles go back a long way into history, I guess mm -hmm. women would have been responsible for looking after very vulnerable babies and, and therefore yeah. need to be more careful about predators and dangers, maybe. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. I think Riyad, would you have any comments there? I think you've unmuted yourself. Uh, yes, I would. Um, um, one um, one explanation is that um, anxiety um, for women has more uh, has had over evolutionary history more benefits, um, and uh, it has had less um, disadvantages than uh, for males. Um, in that. Um, uh, uh, for women to be cautious um, is more reproductively beneficial uh, because of the fact that women have a, 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 a smaller window of reproduction than men do with the menopause. Uh, and therefore, it, is, um, it would be damaging for them to, um, to engage in high risk activity, let's say more damaging than it is for, um, um, for men who have a, a, a wider reproductive window. Um, and uh, they, uh, uh, and um, also for, um, it is um, uh, uh, less uh, disadvant uh, disadvantageous uh, uh, to women in that, uh, high levels of nervousness, anxiety, and so forth, do not damage uh, mating possibilities. That's to say, mate finding and mate retention um, and mate attraction. Whereas a nervous, anxious man um, um, during evolutionary history uh, would have had a lower reproductive success. Um, and this is, this is still evident in, in modern societies where <clears throat> where um, anxious men have a lower um, level of attractiveness to women uh, than, uh, than confident men. Um, and this, again, may go back to uh, gender roles uh, and sex um, roles over evolutionary history, where um, one of the values of long-term mating in a man was their ability to provide protection uh, and, um, um, you know, against uh, rivals, uh, 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 whereas that role wasn't um, uh, very evident or, let's say, important over evolutionary history for women. So these are some of the explanations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rita. And just uh, for, for Silva and for the group generally, I'd also direct your attention to some previous talks we've had um, on our YouTube playlist. So Annie Swanepoel, who is a child psychiatrist from the UK, gave a very interesting talk on evolutionary aspects of ADHD um, in 2021. And uh, there's that's available on our playlist. And then Randolph Nessie uh, is uh, another expert on um, evolutionary perspectives, particularly in relation to anxiety. Fair worth of as well. Okay. So, um, could I just just one final thing, Silva, in relation to your, your your many different roles as a mom and as a clinician and as a medical educator. Where does the evolution perspective help you, do you think, or does it help you in all those zones of your life now? 
Definitely helps in parenting, as I gave the example there. Um, and in terms of um, practicing psychiatry, it's something, as I said, I'm kind of only starting to explore. And I, I do notice that it, it makes a difference uh, on how you view the patient, how you view the illness. It makes it less sort of pathologizing and gives you more understanding on why things are happening the way they are, you know. Okay. So thank you very much, Silva. It was really excellent. And I hope to see your, your essay in, in a published paper format as well. I think it's eminently publishable as it is. Thank you. Okay. okay. So we'll, we'll move on then to um, our other uh, jo uh, joint prize winner, Dr. Gurjat Brar, just popped up on the screen there. And um, hi, Gurjat. And I'll do a brief intro for Gurjat as well. Dr. Gurjat Brar is a higher specialist trainee um, doing dual training in general adult and psychiatry of intellectual uh, disability. Uh, we have someone to mute there. He is currently working as senior registrar in Port Leash. He has also recently taken the position of vice chair of the Evolution and Psychiatry Special Interest Group. Additionally, Gurjat holds Masters in Medical Education and Clinical Neuropsychiatry and retains lively interests in evolutionary psychiatry and psychedelic assisted therapies. So Gurjat, again, congratulations, and we look forward to hearing the summary of your essay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Connell. And that's the, that was a really, really interesting uh, presentation. So it's a really tough act to follow, I think. Um, but I'll do my best. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, just, just while you're waiting there. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, just, just look at the way people, the human race evolves, and people, people identify sub uh, groups as being abnormal. And uh, like, uh, we, oh, yeah. the, I think we're missing the point that uh, you know the way uh, the human race is, is is evolving and being successful is that it's got. Um, a mixture of different types of disorders. So, you know, you need obsessional people, you need mm -hmm. thick, fearless people to fight your wars, you need, you know, you need, a, uh, you need kind of ADHD people to do things quickly, that get bogged down. Uh, so, you, so uh, you know, you need anxious people, you know, to be on the lookout uh, at the centuries, you know. So, uh, to treat kind of disorders, you know, to try and cure disorders, uh, maybe missing the point because we, 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 need, we need everybody linked together, uh, you know, in a, in a society really to make the, you know, say, you know, a country that kind of got rid of, say, all the obsessional people would kind of probably fall apart from a bureaucratic yes. point of view. Or, <laughs> yeah. Kind of yeah. Kind of all the, but what, uh, what's, the, what's the evolutionary niche, though, Ian, for people from Cork? Uh, we're, we're, we're born to rule the world and uh, for people to follow our example and uh, yeah okay so we we only need a small number of you then that's right yeah yeah okay <laughs> you, you yeah. might you might no. pay with <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I a good point I take your point it's it's yeah. very important that that issue of diversity and complementary skills and traits and so on yeah I think I'm good to go. I don't know if you can see this. Yes. Yep. Yeah, you're, you're up there, Gurjit. So if you want to just go ahead. Okay. Um, again, I'm delighted to be here and honoured. Um, um, I'm going to give a talk about my essay. I'm going to be talking through my essay um, and I'll have some slides to kind of illustrate some of the points and hopefully make it um, a bit more appealing. Um, so... Uh, so we'll start with the introduction, really. Uh, evolutionary psychiatry seeks to blend the th theory of evolution with current understanding of mental disorders. As we know, is that it has its primordial roots in ethology and biology, furthered by evolutionary psychology and medicine. Uh, and this is all gaining much traction in recent times, particularly the last two decades. There's been a growing body of literature emerging. But it has yet to have a demonstrable impact on mainstream psychiatry. So in this essay, I, I will explore whether applying evolutionary theory to psychiatry is a conceptual panacea or, or a misfire. So first, we'll look at biological psychiatry and, and placebo. 
Um, mainstream psychiatry has been described to be in a crisis. There have been failures to make significant process in the understanding of mental disorders, coupled with no major breakthroughs in the treatments of, uh, for example, schizophrenia and depression in the last 50 years and 20 years, respectively. Furthermore, a recent systematic review by Moncrief et al. suggests a lack of support for the serotonin theory of depression. Despite large investments and levels of antidepressant use worldwide, new antidepressants and their mechanisms of action further challenge the classic monoaminergic theory, um, and proponents of biological psychiatry appear to be struggling worldwide to coherently and cogently justify approaches based on neurotransmitter theories alone after providing treatments with limited therapeutic efficacies despite decades of cost and time intensive research. The principal idea of proximate causation in biological psychiatry really has precluded, precluded appreciation of the, of the context and the environment in which the patient exists. So focus on these clean randomized controlled trials ticks away from real world pragmatic conditions in which our parents reside. Conversely, the evolutionary perspective does not discount the environment, shedding light on how our brains develop and dysfunction in the presence of their environment, and thus asks, thus seeks to ask ult ultimate questions regarding psychiatric symptoms and syndromes. In other words, while biological psychiatry is concerned with faulty brain mechanisms and is context independent, the evolutionary perspective seeks to add that psychiatric symptoms and syndromes are context dependent arising from adaptations to environments long past. This transdiagnostic view reconceptualizes psychiatric disorders as aggregates of behavioral systems in a state of dysfunction, rather than the limited drug-centered model view of neuro neural circuit dysfunction, which lead to symptoms requiring psychopharmacological treatment. I argue that an over-reliance on mechanistic explanations and proximate causation undermines the complexity and multi-layered nature of, of mental disorders. This is particularly so when placebo responses and the equivalence paradox seen in psychotherapy amount for large effect sizes seen in research trials, and in some cases even eclipsing treatment effects. While we currently struggle to ethically justify harnessing these effects for our patients, few have actually asked the ultimate question of how natural selections favor the evolution of self-healing mechanisms closely linked to contexts in which the treatment is delivered. An evolutionary perspective releases us from this ethical dilemma and justifies the psychological and sociocultural effects of such contexts, thus allowing a non-reductionist, context-specific view of the patient in contrast to the narrow view offered by biological psychiatry as it is currently defined. Okay, I'm gonna stop beating on biological psychiatry for a minute and move to function and dysfunction. So psychiatry has explored the complexities of human emotions and behavior for many years. However, despite the vast amount of research conducted in this area, there appears to be a lack of understanding about the physiological aspects of these phenomena. This lack of clarity is in stark contrast to the rest of medicine, where the body's physiology is a crucial reference point for understanding disorders and dysfunction. To better treat and understand psychiatric disorders, a greater understanding of the physiological processes that underpin human behavior is necessary. Evolutionary psychiatry has thus been proclaimed by some evolutionists, particularly Randolph Nessie, as the essential missing basic science. Before further exploration, um, it's important to state the potential error that we can make of viewing diseases as adaptations. Evolutionists believe that it's not the diseases themselves that have evolved as adaptations, but rather the traits and systems that make us vulnerable to such diseases. By this logic, the traits and systems that make us susceptible to diseases could be seen as evolutionary adaptations, as these have been passed down through generations and selected for due to their um, advantageous nature in allowing us to survive and reproduce. This explains why certain diseases are more prevalent in some regions than others due to selection pressures. One such example are the heterozygote carriers of sickle cell disease conferring protection against malaria 
in endemic zones. Moving on to mismatch. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, but it's one of the leading theories um, in evolutionary psychiatry. The non-reductionist evolutionary approach seeks to embrace complexity and provide several testable theories in which to understand mental disorders. So a good starting place is uh, the generation and testing of hypotheses based on mismatch theory. Evolutionary mismatch, also known as genome lag, has been implicated for a range of disorders with increased prevalence in our modern environment such as hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. These diseases of civilization are thought to arise due to modern environments containing an abundance of food combined with increased sedentary lifestyles. Further examples of mismatch in modern environments across biopsychosocial domains include biologically low-grade chronic inflammation, psychologically high levels of chronic stress, and socially involuntary social isolation and loneliness. As always, no single factor can be said to be causative, but rather a combination and greater magnitudes of mismatch may leave an individual vulnerable to disease. Thus, the evolutionary perspective allows us to ask questions such as what advantages such traits may have conferred in the environment of evolutionary adaptedness, which is a term evolutionists Evolutionists used to describe an overall ancestral human environment during which distinctive traits of modern humans were shaped, but which is important to remember, not limited to any single time or place. Some studies investigating the effect of mismatch um, in contemporary hunter-gatherer societies have been conducted. These suggest postpartum depression may be a phenotypic mismatch and potentially evolved as an adaptation to curb high infant mortality rates. Also, ADHD is potentially an environmental mismatch due to the appearance of a particular allele uh, 40,000 years ago conferring advantages to foraging. Finally, two studies investigating depression based on the Simani tribe described the sickness defense as reallocation of energy to immune function, and lower functional ability and lower participation in subsistence to be associated with higher depression scores. The findings of these studies are coherent with much of the literature uh, in evolutionary psychiatry. So now time to be on the DSM, uh, issues with current models. The DSM-5 criteria for psychiatric disorders has been criticized as descriptivist um, oversimplifying units of dysfunction. We know that symptoms are shared between disorders and appear in subclinical forms in healthy populations, which vary in severity and character, both within and between individuals and temporally. It is unlikely with the current paradigm in psychiatry to make coherent sense of all these discrepancies. An underlying unifying organizing principle with sufficient explanatory power is required. I think you know where I'm going with this. Furthermore, current psychiatric formulations often provide reductionist views, assuming neural dysfunction as primary proximate causes. Psychopharmacology then tends to focus on proximate causes without duly considering the context and environment in which these symptoms arise. An evolutionary perspective offers much needed contextualization, truly integrating the biopsychosocial model. Um, and ontogeny and phylogeny, which is the development of the species. The non-reductionist expansion of the biopsychosocial bio model is, to me, the final third act, bringing much needed coherence to the formulation of psychiatric patients. So here you can see a, a usual structure, a structure of, of acts from theatre. The first act began with a move from a largely psychoanalytic paradigm towards a biomedical view of psychiatric disorder. Then with Engel in 1977, the biopsychosocial model promulgated far and wide with its additional emphasis on psychosocial factors, albeit with its own limitations. Finally, we arrive at act three, which is a union of Engel's BPS levels and Mayer and Tinbergen's evolutionary questions where Hunt et al. Um, in a recent evolutionary psychiatry textbook have proposed a model for proximate and ultimate understanding of depression uh, in, in a following table. 
um, in the following table here. Here it can be useful to understand the seemingly universality of low mood to be an evolved adaptive response, for example, shaped by social status decline to reduce futile or dangerous conflict in ancestral environments. Correspondingly, mismatch in modern contexts has provided a natural propensity for low mood to develop into cl clinical depression. The BPS model taken alone limits our temporal understanding of our patient to their ontogeny, whereas considering the evolutionary history and relevant phylogeny allows us to gain deeper insights. By omitting this crucial aspect, we are only revealing the tip of the iceberg and potentially doing a disservice to patients. And ah, yes, here's a lovely cliche picture of an iceberg to suitably illustrate my point. Okay, so moving on to future directions and where where evolutionary psychiatry and evolutionary theory has actually made some progress. Biological clinical applications of evolutionary psychiatry can be thought of already in their prime. Scientists recognize our biology and key molecules present throughout our body are comparable to other species. We share nervous systems and neurotransmitters with both invertebrates and other vertebrates. And considerable research has been done in establishing homology in the functional specialization of, of the brain from macaques and other primates, particularly the frontal lobes. In terms of research trials, an evolutionary approach may allow us to look past the rigid paradigm of conventional psychotropic research, predominantly, which is predominantly based on idealistic RCTs. Instead, we may develop a rigorous multifaceted model of research, also placing emphasis on, for example, well-designed naturalistic and observational studies, allowing for capturing novel insights into the role of uh, treatment in psychiatry. Evolutionary, evolutionary perspectives also allow for broader and more prog pragmatic measures of health and illness, placing individuals in their wider social context. A notable example here is the social acronym coined by Randolph Nessie, standing for social situation, occupation, children and family, income, abilities, and love and sex. This can be used to guide a broader definition of health and well-being, allowing psychiatry to pivot away from measuring outcomes as mere reductions on questionnaires. Additionally, another acronym um, you can see that evolutionists are favorite, uh, <laughs> do like their acronyms. Um, so GOAL, um, developed by uh, Troisi, uh, who's an Italian uh, evolutionary psychiatrist, give less weight to symptoms, observe actual behavior, assess functional capacities, and leave your office to observe behavior in natural environments. This allows for stratifying patients in terms of their functional capacities and targeting treatment accordingly. Troisi also argues that interpersonal relationships psychiatrists have with patients is also of biological relevance and is to be wielded as a para powerful therapeutic tool as a target of future empirical research. Moving on, medical curricula can take advantage of individual differences to produce rich and varied doctors rather than continue unconsciously in the favor of standardization. Indeed, it is startling how little, if any, content on evolutionary medicine makes it to undergraduate education, let alone evolutionary psychiatry. Trials of interventions based on mismatch reduction therapy um, could be conducted to produce a more rigorous and prospective evidence base for evolutionary informed interventions. Such therapies would encourage attenuation of mismatch by replication of relevant aspects of ancestral environments and lifestyles in a more contemporary relevant manner. Far from advocating a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, an evolutionary informed understanding of our phylogenetic past allows us to recognize the current magnitudes of mismatch and attempt to modify our behavior accordingly. Although research is ongoing, contemporary hunter-gatherer societies are reported to have increased psychological well-being and lower prevalence of mental disorders. At least one factor appears to be cooperation and group cohesion with synchrony-based community rituals, such as singing and dancing, which increases oxytocin and neuro um, endorphins. 
In contrast, in modern contexts, it has been reported the odds of suicide are six times higher in those not engaged in some form of religious congregation, and less than 1% in the UK, for example, attend church weekly. Additionally, it has been suggested providing evolutionary explanations of psychoeducation to patients for mental disorders can have a therapeutic effect. Um, a possible multimodal group therapeutic approach grounded in evolutionary psychiatry um, is given in this table. Um, patients and healthcare providers seek to gain much from adopting an evolutionary approach. For example, higher levels of stigma propagated through delegitimization, social exclusion and rejection is a well-documented finding in many mental disorders, particularly in conversion and somatization disorders when compared to similar disorders with observable pathology. An evolutionary approach can provide normalization of these stigmatized disorders and enhance a therapeutic relationship. A recent publication aims to enhance cognitive behavioral therapy using just such an evolutionary approach under the term ICT, informed cognitive therapy. These additional biological and sociocultural questions informed by an evolutionary perspective are likely to help bring much needed scientific rigor to evaluating treatments in psychiatry. One such topical application is with psychedelic therapies. An evolutionary perspective may allow novel insights into the recruitment of subjects, individual and population benefits, and adverse effects of therapy. Finally, research guided at understanding the past is now accepted as essential to evolutionary science and is capable of producing rigorous and falsifiable models of past environments. My last slide in conclusion, recent interest in evolutionary psychiatry with simultaneous disappointments in the current model of biological psychiatry are creating fertile conditions for a new paradigm shift to take hold. While this shift may not involve cutting edge sophisticated research, it nonetheless bears significant potential for re-energizing the field of psychiatry. The clinician armed with a good understanding of evolutionary psychiatry can include this approach to the diagnosis, formulation and management of patients. Despite an emphasis on theories and methods, evolutionary psychiatry provides a new conceptual framework in which to integrate the various findings from disparate research fields studying human behavior and mental disorders cohesively integrating ultimate and proximate causes for a more complete clinical picture. From history, we recognize paradigms are not only necessary, but frequent and arrive during periods of stagnation. In conclusion, this is no false dawn. Thank you. Thank you, Gersha. That was uh, superb as well. I really enjoyed it. And um, I think people should know that this is probably a project number 15 that Gurdjieff has been working on over the last 12 months um, in terms of research projects, completed papers, publications, book reviews, um, not, not to mention he's taking up the role as vice chair of our group. Um, so he's he's had a stellar performance and it's, it's really uh, great to see. Um, young psychiatrists like Gurjat and, and Silva uh, um, just be, get em, embracing this whole area and seeing how it helps in, in terms of hopefully in terms of your clinical practice and your ideas on research and, and uh, education in the longer term. Um, so I'm just going to go to Riyad first because Riyad has his hand up virtually. <laughs> Riyad. Yes, thank you um, very much, Henry. Um, well, all I can say is, wow. The, 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 these two presentations uh, were absolutely brilliant. Um, and really, anyone who hasn't joined, who's interested in evolution, has really missed out. These were two brilliant uh, presentations. I, I'd like to congratulate both Silva and Gerjot on, on really stellar work and um, absolutely um, 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 really amazing that, um, um, I mean, both of them uh, are, they have taught themselves, haven't they? Because, yes. um, uh, you know, their, their, uh, um, evolution is not part of any uh, postgraduate or undergraduate curriculum, uh, un you know, unfortunately. And, um, um, uh, and they, have, they have managed to get on top of the subject. Um, so congratulations to them. I, I just have 
uh, a, a, a short comment about Gerjot's um, um, presentation. I just want to raise uh, the question of, um, I mean, Gerjot has quite rightly uh, critiqued the uh, reductionist approach of biological psychiatry uh, and um, advocated a non-reductionist approach. But um, I, I just want to ask you, Gerjot, uh, you haven't mentioned anything about emergent properties um, and um, their role in conceptualizing um, mental disorder um, and also about understanding function and dysfunction. Um, uh, and um, I would just want to add that the, these emergent properties that are, are quite often neglected, this concept is neglected in biological psychiatry, are in fact, you know, things such as mood, cognition, behavior, these are the phenotypic end products of selection, and these can be multiply realized, that's to say realized or produced or generated through multiple neurobiological routes, uh, and therefore reducing things like mood just to activity at the molecular 5-HT level and so forth can misunderstand it um, and uh, can lead psychiatry down a blind alley. So any comments on that, Gerjot? Um, first of all, I, I, I agree. Um, secondly, I obviously I ran out of uh, word count and time, so I couldn't really uh discuss everything I, I wanted to um but yeah no you make a very valid point um mm. i wonder if uh, anybody else more knowledgeable than i could 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 weigh in um but absolutely reducing such such complex and multi-layered uh uh i guess phenomena if you if you would call them uh, emergent phenomena it is it, it's a folly really it's it's only going to lead us uh, towards um, not adequately managing our patients, um, and it's just not gonna, it's not gonna hold up for much longer, I think. Um, and I think things are going to change. Yeah, I think as well. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Riyad. Does it does it tie in, Riyad, with your your idea of of um, looking at new ways of conceptualizing depression in terms of evolution informed research um, rating scales? Are you getting at that as well, or is that a different area? Well, I think it, it, it is related, but it's not identical. The, okay. the, um, it, it just seems to me that the, the error that biological psychiatry, which, I mean, let's face it, biological, biological psychiatry is the dominant um, um, uh, model, uh, let's say, the... Um, uh, uh, it's the sort of dominant medical model currently in psychiatry, although, of course, they, there are other strands to mainstream psychiatry, such as social, social psychiatry and so forth. Um, but biological psychiatry for the past at least 25, 30 years has been the dominant um, school of thought in uh, mainstream psychiatry. And uh, the reductionist approach I mean, as we all know, a lot of our conferences, a lot of uh, our, uh, the mainstream psychiatry conferences deal with this molecular level of activity and, um, and they get so immersed in it uh, that we forget um, that these molecular level actions are in fact not what has been selected by evolution. Uh, it is the phenotypic properties of the individual that has been, such as mood, behavior, cognition, and so forth, at the level of the individual. And these can be realized through multiple routes. And this is not unique to, to, uh, to the central nervous system or to psychiatry. This, is a, a, this, is, this applies to biology in general. Uh, the multiple realizability uh, of phenotypic properties um, is, uh, is, is, a, is a general biological property. So losing sight of that um, and thinking that, you know, understanding things at the molecular, at the molecular uh, level um, uh, and considering 
that the molecular, you know, like mood, for instance, is nothing other than activity at the serotonergic uh, receptor leads us to um, errors uh, and 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 um, and incomplete or completely erroneous models uh, of psychiatric disorder. So that, well, that's really the point. But uh, I mean, as you say, the 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 um, uh, looking at the issue of function at the level of the individual in terms of evaluating our, our um, interventions and treatments uh, is something evolution can help with. Okay, thank you. So um, unless there's any other questions, I think we'll, we'll draw to a close then. And um, again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all of our guests, especially to Riyadh from joining us in the UK and for all his support from the Royal College.